Hey, let's go to the Lord in prayer. How about that? Father, I come to you this morning and um, God, I just pray that everything that we have done, you've been pleased with. Father, I pray that um, as we just sang that you are my everything and I adore you. Father, I pray that's true for, true for us that sing it. And Father, if it's not, I pray that you would open our eyes and open our hearts so that you would become our everything, that we would understand that there is nothing in this life that is more important than our relationship with you. Father, I just pray, God, that you would help us truly understand that It'll profit us nothing to gain the whole world and yet lose our soul. And so, Father, I pray, God, that as we sing songs like that, that they can be true about us. And, Lord, I pray You would forgive us in the places that it's not. But, Lord, lead us to repentance. Lord, turn us around and just help us to be where we're supposed to be, Father. We, we have no hope except for You. Father, I pray this morning for um, the... Um, Family members here that um, ha are that are sick or are recovering from sicknesses or recovering from surgeries or have family members that are sick, Father, I pray this morning for uh, Josh Gilbert's mother, Lord, in the in the hospital, Father, and just um, not doing well. And Father, I just pray for her this morning. And God, I just pray you'd have mercy on her, Father. I pray that you would uh, restore her back to um, to the health that she needs to continue on in this life and and. And, and stay a little longer with her family. Father, nevertheless, not our will, Your will be done. God, we trust You. We know that You are good if You give, and we know You are good when You take away. And so, Father, I pray that their faith would not fail no matter what You decide to do. Father, I pray this morning for, um, uh, as I said earlier, the ones that are recovering for surgeries. And God, I just ask God that, um, Lord, You would strengthen their bones, that You would strengthen their bodies to be able to make a quick recovery, God. And, Lord, I pray that they'd be careful to give You the glory for what You're doing in their lives. Father, I pray that in their weakness, that they show You, you are strong. That they show that, Lord, even if this body is failing and going away, Father, that You are our strength. And Father, I pray, God, that um, they glorify You in everything, that we glorify You in everything that we go through. And Father, right now we are um, we're getting ready to hear from You personally. Father, You said Your Word is living. You said it's active. You said it's powerful. And Father, right now we are, we're believing that what we're going to get from Your Word this morning is the same as You spoke it originally back then. And Father, I pray that we would hear You speak, and I pray, God, that we would be changed forever by what we hear from You. Father, again, I thank You for this people that are, are able to be here this morning, and I pray for the ones that are traveling. Father, I, Lord, I know we got several that are um, uh, camping or at the beach or, Father, just um, uh, in various places. And, Lord, we just pray for their safety. And, Father, we pray for all of our family that, Lord, You would just continue to, to keep us together. And, Lord, You would keep us growing in, in You, growing in our love for each other and especially our love for You. Father, we love You and we ask You for these things because, again, You are, you are our God. You are our Father. And, Lord, we know You're good. So, Father, we ask You for these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, if you got your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Hebrews. And as I always tell you, um, if, if you have your Bibles, please pick them up. Try to follow along with me. If you didn't, everybody's got a phone. Most of your 10-year-olds have a phone, so get your phone out. You can download a Bible app pretty quick. And so um, I'm preaching from the ESV version, but um, I need you to understand that you, you're not here this morning to hear what I have to say. What I tell you this morning, I promise you, none of it will be what I have to say. It will be what God has already said, and that alone. And so I'm praying this morning that you will see it for yourself, and that when you leave, you will not be mad at me or glad at me, whichever way you want to go. <laughs> I pray that you would hear from God, and that you would literally be able to make the choice in your own life what you plan on doing with what God has spoken to you personally. And it'll be up to you what you do with it. So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 3, and we're going to read starting in verse 12. And we're going to go through chapter 4 and verse 3. So um, just imagine this morning that there were no chapters and verses, because when they wrote this letter, there wasn't. It was just a letter. 
chapters and verses have been added so that you and I are able to organize this Word of God and put it in, uh, be able to find things a lot easier. All right, Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. It says this, Take care, brothers. What does that mean? Take care, brothers. Be careful. In other words, we first get a warning, right? Take care, brothers, lest there be in who? Is anybody exempt from this? Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end, so how do I know that I have, be, I have become a partaker in Christ? How do I know I have a share in Him? If I hold on to it all the way to the end, that is the evidence that I was truly born again, correct? Alright. Verse 15, As it is said today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard His voice and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was He provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did He swear that they would not enter His rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter God's rest because of why? All right, you can be seated. Today is my last message in the series that we've been on for a while now on what it means to be born again. As I told you last week, it is my greatest desire, if you didn't get anything else out of this message, out of these series of messages, it is my greatest desire that none of you will be able to leave this congregation of believers and not understand what it means to be saved. I want you to understand that we're not just talking about praying a prayer. We're not just talking about believing in Jesus. Even the demons believe, don't they? We're talking about a new creation. We're talking about the fact that you were dead in your sins because in your sins you were cut off from the source of life who is our God and Father. And because you were dead, the only way that you could be reconciled to God is if you are given a new life. And so he tells us that we have, in our sins, we have impure hearts, right? We have hearts that don't want to honor God, but we have hearts that want to be God. And that's, that's just the truth. We come from the womb saying, give me what I want. And if you don't give me what I want, I'm going to let you know about it. Right? And so we are born with these impure hearts that don't want to honor God, but instead want to honor me. Want to do what I want to do. Don't tell me what to do and what I can and can't do. I don't need you to tell me what's right and what's wrong, God. I can decide for myself what's right and what's wrong. And because of that heart, it separates us from the source of life and causes us to be dead men walking. It tells us that we have um, minds that have been given over to, um, to, to be debased. Literally, they are the lowest of the low. We, our minds lead us to do things that are, that are not fitting. And then there's a whole list of them in Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32. You can read it yourself and see there. But the point is, how many of you know that your mind is an evil place? I mean, stuff goes through your mind that ain't godly, 
whatsoever. We have those kind of minds. And the Bible tells us that we have dishonorable passions, that we have passions inside of us that are not honorable and want to honor God, but instead they are passions that dishonor God and dishonor the fact that we were made in the image of His glory. And that's who we are in our sin. And the Bible tells us we must be born again. And here's what God promised He would do. He said, I will give you a new heart. I will give you a heart that wants to honor me. I will give you a new mind. I will give you a mind that won't, that learns about me and is renewed day after day after day and it, and it has a desire to, to honor me and to follow me. I will give you new passions. Passions that you want to be pleasing to God. And He does all this by putting His Holy Spirit inside of you. And when He comes to dwell in you by the power of His Spirit, He begins to make a new creation. The Bible says, Behold, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. The old things are gone. Behold, the new has come. This is what it means to be a Christian. Not a believer. Not somebody who just prayed a prayer but somebody who has been made new because God has breathed life into them that honors Him, that wants to follow Him. Basically, you can put it like this. God puts you in the war with sin. And He gives you a heart and a mind that wants to destroy sin. You hate your sin. You hate it. And your heart wants to honor God. And yet that battle is going on inside of you. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Because before being born again, guess what? That battle wasn't really there. Now I'm not saying you didn't have a conscience. We're all born with a conscience. We're all born with a knowledge of right and wrong. And we are taught that as we grow. But you didn't have a desire to be honoring to God, to be pleasing to God, to be glorifying to God in your sin. But now that you are born again, you have that. And if those evidences are not there, then the truth of the matter is it's possible that you have not been born again. Quite likely, as a matter of fact. In John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus told some of the people who believed in Him, they were Jews and they believed in Him, and He told them, if you abide or if you continue in My Word, you are truly... My disciples. So what's the evidence that they are truly His disciples? They stay in His Word. They continue in it. See, they believed in Him. Go back to the, if you want to go back to the verse before, in John chapter 8, I think it's verse 30, I believe is where it is. It says, many of the Jews believed in Him. And He says to them, if you continue in My Word, then that will prove that you are truly My disciples. So what does that say about people that, Believe in Him, but don't abide in His Word. Go to verse 32. If I gave it to Him. I didn't give it to Him. I'm sorry. But here's what it says. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So in other words, if you are a true disciple, then you will stay in the Word. Not just studying, but you will follow Him. You will follow His teachings. And then, here's what will happen. As you abide in His Word, you will know the truth. And guess what the truth will do for you? Here's the process of being born again. He gives you new life. You believe in Him, yes. But then there's a heart change, a mind change. You abide in His Word. As you abide in His Word, you prove you are His disciples and you know the truth because you learn it from Him and then the truth sets you free from your sin. And you are able to put the sin off and you're able to put on the truth of Jesus Christ. This is the message of the entire New Testament. So when I look at you today and tell you that saying a prayer is not what saved you, I hope you can see that. Listen, our culture today has literally taught you. It still irks me today because I I used to be in this mindset, but I see preachers get on TV now and they say, just pray this prayer after me. 
and just, just believe in Jesus and you will be saved. And the truth of the matter is, that's the culture of how we have been trained to preach the gospel. That's not the gospel. The gospel is, you must be born again. And when God does this supernatural work in your life, a change takes place. A new creation begins to be made. The author in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14 right here, notice what he said in the Scriptures we just read. In verse 14, for we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. And I could take you to, to probably a hundred other passages that will prove to you the evidence of someone has truly believed in Jesus. Not just, I believe, but I believe in Him. I know who He is, I trust what He says, and I follow Him. The evidence is I stay with Him, I abide in it. I know the truth, the truth sets me free, and I have become a partaker in Christ if I hold my original confidence firm to the end. To the end. And so again, the point is, God is going to make a new creation in you. It is going to happen if you are born again. And you are going to be a person that is putting off the old and putting on the new. And if you don't see that taking place in your life, then it is likely that you have never been born again and you ought to cry out to God and believe the gospel. If God opens your eyes to that fact this morning, that's God drawing you to say, okay, your eyes have been opened that you've not been born again, so here's what you need to do. Believe what I said to you. Believe on Jesus. Trust in Him. And come and have your sins washed away as God puts His power and His Holy Spirit in you to dwell in you from here until the day that we go home to be with Him forever. And that is exactly what He will do. And this is His work. God starts the work and God finishes what He started. So just a little context. Hebrew is a letter written to some Jewish believers that were beginning to fall away. <clears throat> These believers had come to Jesus, they believed in Him, and they had got off to a good start. But now some things are happening that this writer looks at this church and he says, there's some problems, and they're beginning to drift away. Let me prove it to you. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible actually tells us, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we what? Drift away from it. So again, he's addressing the fact that they're not paying attention to what they heard at the beginning. They're not abiding in Him and in His Word, but instead they're beginning to drift away from it. Another scripture, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. I'm just going to give you an overview of, of Hebrews in this thing. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, look what he says. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. So there again, the warning is, I see some things happening that looks like you're going backwards, you're drifting, you're falling away. Now he's not saying you're losing your salvation because he also said, we know we've actually become partakers in Christ if we hold on. Jesus said, you are truly my disciples indeed if you continue to abide in my word. So the evidence of genuine salvation is that you continue. And the warning here is that if you see yourself not continuing, then a genuine believer is going to heed this warning and guess what he's going to do? He's going to turn it around. You know why he's going to turn it around? Because he has a heart that ultimately wants to be pleasing to God. He has a mind that is eating him alive, that he wants to be pleasing to God. And so he hears the warning, he turns around. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. It says that some were looking like they might not reach the promised land. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, while the promise of entering His rest stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. So again, the whole point is Hebrews, here's what I want to do this morning. 
I'm going to give you a few more scriptures to show you that the entire book of Hebrews is about a group of Christians that look like they're falling away. And they're warning after warning after warning. That's the reason why so many people misinterpret this book and believe it teaches you can lose your salvation. No. He's trying to tell them, if you're truly saved, then I need to warn you. Because if you're truly saved, you're looking like you're, you're looking like you're not. You should seem to have failed to reach it. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12. Some of them had just stopped growing in their faith. He said, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 35, they were throwing away their confidence. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence in Christ, in the gospel. Their confidence was being proved in the fact that they were following Him. They were trusting Him. They were believing Him. They were modeling their life after Him. And all of a sudden, they're not doing that anymore. So what are they doing? They're throwing their confidence away, which has a great reward. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36, they were beginning to just slow down in the Christian race. Instead of continuously putting off the things that don't belong and putting on the things that do, they were slowing down. And He says to them, for you have need of what? Endurance to keep on keeping on. You have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, this is what he says to them. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with Endurance. So in other words, they're not laying aside the weights and the sins that cling so closely to them anymore. They're not putting off the things that are dishonoring to God and putting on the things that are. And now he says to them, guys, you got to get back up and you got to get back in the race. And you got to run it with endurance. And then finally, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12 and 13, he paints a picture for them and here's what he says. Therefore, lift your drooping hands. Now this whole picture has been about a race, right? And what happens when you get tired in a race? You start out, you got perfect form, right? I mean, you are, you, you're doing it. But then by that last lap, what's happened to those hands? And here's where this church is at. And he says to them, lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, and go to verse 13 and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Warning after warning after warning, if you are truly born again, if you are truly a partaker in Jesus Christ, you better get in this race. Because the evidence that you are truly saved is that you are putting off the old, and the new man has come. And if that race is not being run with endurance, here's what he says, lift up those drooping hands, strengthen those weak knees, and get back in this race and get back to where you are supposed to be. So with that said, in Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 12, we're going to walk through what these verses tell us. The title of my message this morning are the symptoms of falling away from the living God. What can I see in my life? What does this writer see in the Hebrew church? What is it that he sees in their life that says, you're falling away from the living God and you're about to prove that you're not truly born again. You're about to prove you're not truly His disciples indeed. Because this would be a good time for a self-examination this morning, correct? So verse 12, we see first the cause of falling away. What is it that caused us to fall away? Is it because I have a sin in my life? Is it because I struggle with a sin in my life? Is that what causes me to fall away from a living God? No, look at what he says. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you a what? An evil, unbelieving heart is the only cause that will make you fall away from the living God. That's the reason he said, 
You've got to hold on to your confidence and your belief firm to the end. The reason why I'm following Him is because I believe what He says. I believe Him. And so ultimately, if I begin to fall away, you know what it says? I don't believe Him. I don't really believe this stuff. You know how many people sit in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and the truth of the matter is, they don't believe this. They don't believe this. Because if they did, something would be different. You know how I know Noah believed that God was going to flood this earth with His wrath? <laughs> the way I know Noah believed, Noah built an ark. You know the way you know if you believe? By what you do, by following Jesus. So the only way that you are going to fall away from a living God is if you have an evil, unbelieving heart. And the author here says, you better take care lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, proving that you were never partakers in Christ. So what are the symptoms of an evil, unbelieving heart? What is it that I can look at and say, here's a warning that I either have an evil, unbelieving heart or I need to get back in the race? One of two things. Here's the first one, verse 13. He says here, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Here's the first symptom of an evil, unbelieving heart. Being deceived by sin. Literally, it, it, here is... Um, you remember in the Garden of Eden, whenever Eve was deceived, Satan came to her and he said, did God really say that you can't eat from this tree? And did He really say that if you eat from it, you will die? You won't surely die. But God knows that in the day that you eat from it, you will be like Him, knowing good from evil. And He just don't want you to be like Him. And so ultimately, sin promised Eve that you're not going to really die. This sin is not really going to kill you. This sin is not really going to separate you from God because God's a loving God, right? And God is a forgiving God, right? And God is a merciful God, right? Guess what else God is? God is also a just God. And God is also a vengeful God. And God is also a wrathful God. So which one of those are you going to pick right now? And how are you going to weigh one out more than the other? The truth of the matter is sin always lies to you and it deceives you. And sin always says to you, this won't really hurt you. This don't really hurt anybody. And so the, God understands why you do what you do. God knows your heart. Only God can judge me, right? Only God can judge me. Well, guess what? That ought to scare you to death. And so sin will lie to you and it will deceive you and it will tell you every time, this is not really a big deal. You can play with this. You can have this in your eye. You don't really need to put this off. I mean, this is, I mean, look at our culture today. Our culture says sin is not a big deal. I mean, you can't help who you love. You can't help how you were born. But you better pray you're born again. And so he says very plainly right here that you need to make sure that you understand that the way that an evil, unbelieving heart begins to reveal itself is whenever you allow sin to continuously deceive you. In other words... There is no putting off. There is no putting on. You believe sin every time it tells you, hey, this will make you happy. Because God says, this will kill you. And you got two choices. You can either believe God when He says, if you do this, you will die. Because it separates you from the source of life. Or you can believe your sin that says, you won't really die. 
God just don't want you to be happy. God just wants to take away from you the things that actually make you happy. The deceitfulness of sin will eventually harden your heart toward God. The Ephesians told us you become calloused. You know what a callous is, don't you? And so your heart literally becomes hardened and calloused because you have been deceived over and over again to the point that you now have a mind that says, God's not going to do anything about that. But let me tell you what the the true Word of God says to us. The wrath of God is coming. And it is coming for the sons of disobedience. Listen to me guys, God does not cast sin into hell. You know what He casts into hell? The sinner. People say, well God hates the sin, but He loves the sinner. God ain't sending sin to hell. Sin is not going to inherit eternal punishment in hell. But you know who is? The sinner. The children of disobedience. And so yes, God is merciful. And on the one hand, He holds back His wrath while He offers His grace. And on the other hand, there is coming a day when He turns His hand loose from mercy and He lets His wrath come and all of that wrath is going to be unleashed on sinners. And so we say to you this morning, do not be deceived by the deceitfulness of sin. Guys, if you are not actively involved in the war of putting off and putting on, then I'm telling you this morning, you're being deceived. You're believing the lie. And you are getting more calloused toward God and toward His ways every day that goes by. So, that's the first thing. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Listen to what he says. Beloved... I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Stay away from it. Run from it. Get away from the passions of your flesh that are against God. You know why? Because they wage war against what? Your soul. There is a war going on. And if you are not in the war with your sin, I'm telling you right now, you are probably a child of disobedience in which the wrath of God is coming for one day. The next thing, the next symptom of an evil, unbelieving heart, again found in verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 3. But exhort one another every day. In other words, here's why he's saying to exhort. He's saying, or y'all remember what exhort means. Exhort is um, making an urgent appeal, such as telling the troops to hold the line. Literally, the troops are in war, right? They're being backed down by the enemy, but then the captain or whoever stands up and says, hold the line. And that is an urgent appeal to tell them to stand strong, don't be backed down. And so he says here in this verse, he says, but exhort one another. Every day. In other words, just command each other to hold the line. Don't quit. Don't stop fighting. Stay in this race. Exhort one another every day. As long as it is called today, that none of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So in other words, you got the deceitfulness of sin is the danger that leads to an unbelieving heart, right? What's the cure? It's what we're doing this morning. It's what I'm doing for you right here. But it's not just meant for me to do it just to you. It's meant for us to exhort one another. We gather together in in Sunday schools and in Bible studies and in small groups and, and we do life together. And let me tell you something, we got a long ways to go. we got a lot to figure out. Because we got this church thing semi-figured out. But doing life together to where we spend time day after day really involved in each other's life and trying to help each other stay in the race. God designed this thing as a single body. And He put us all in here together with multiple gifts for the purpose of keeping us in the race and keeping us growing until we reach the goal of Christ-likeness. Correct? And so that's what we do here. 
And here's one of the symptoms of an unbelieving evil heart. We have no more, how did I put it? You quit helping each other stay in the race. Instead of gathering together and exhorting one another, you know what we do? We're not worried about nobody else. As long as I'm good. As long as I'm all right. Let me prove to you that this was a symptom that this author saw here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25. Look at what he says here. Here's what he commands them to do. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and to good works. So here's what he wants you to do. Let's consider, let's look at each other. That's what it means to consider, right? And let's figure out how we can stir each other up to love and good works. You know why? Because that's the evidence that you're in the race. The evidence that you're in the race and you're pursuing Christ are the love and the good works that are in your life. You're abiding in His Word and you're loving one another. So let us consider how to stir one another up to love and to good works. And then, but instead of doing this, here's what they were doing, and we all fall guilty of this. Now remember, when I said this, I told you, don't leave here mad at me or glad at me. Either way, this is not my word, and I am just as guilty of this and many other sins as you are. Y'all understand what I'm saying to you? We're in this together. This ain't some self-righteous preacher up here that's got it all figured out that's up here trying to tell you this is what's wrong with you and you need to get this together. This is what I say to me too. Remember what the first verse said? Take care, brethren, lest there be in who? Am I exempt from any of you? No, I'm not. And so here's a symptom of an evil, unbelieving heart. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but instead encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. How many of you can look around our world today and honestly say, we're closer today than we have ever been? I'm just telling you right now, I'm not, I'm not trying to predict anything bad on our great nation. But let's just be honest. How much longer do you really think God is going to let us keep going off of this roller coaster hill in this direction we're going? I ain't prophesying. I ain't saying it'll be a hundred years, two hundred, ten. I, I, I'm not saying. I don't know. But I'm telling you this. History tells me that God will reach a point that He said, I've had enough. I've had enough. And I really do believe that we are seeing the day drawing near more and more. And so instead of neglecting to meet together, which is the habit of any of us, correct? Instead of that, he says, exhort one another daily because that's how we help keep each other from falling away from the living God. Guys, I'm so ashamed as I preach this this morning because I have sit here and watched so many that I'm looking out in these pews that were walking this walk with me and in this race with me and they left and they walked away and I really didn't put forth a whole lot of effort. I mean, not, not much. Not much effort at all to really try to exhort them to get back in this race. Lift up your drooping hands. Strengthen your weak knees. I know you're tired. I know you've been doing this. I know it's hard. Y'all know the race. How many of you know a race is not easy? Right? It's not easy. I know it's hard. But you've got to get back in this thing. You have got to quit doing these things, as is the habit of some, and instead get back into exhorting each other and encouraging each other more and more as the day approaches. So that is the second thing. Go back with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 3. Let's read verse uh, 14 again since we're already there. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So there again, he's just telling them, you got to stay in the race. You can't have an evil unbelieving heart. You have to stay in the race because the evidence that you are actually a partaker in Christ is that you stay in this thing all the way to the end. 
And if you don't stay in this thing all the way to the end, you are going to be like these people that were in the rebellion in the Old Testament. Y'all see what he's doing? All right. Now, so in verse 15, we get our third symptom. As it is said, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. How many times do we hear the voice of God? I mean, I'm preaching it this morning right now, and there are some people in here right now that are probably hearing it, and because it's coming from me, and they hear it coming from me, they harden their heart. What would you do different if God Himself were standing in the flesh right now, and you knew, that's God, (laughs) that is the man. And you knew that's Him. And He's preaching this message to you. You hear His voice. You hear what He says. You can't argue with Him. You, all you can do is say, you're right. You're exactly right. But how many times do we hear the voice of God and instead of responding in repentance, we respond in rebellion. We harden our hearts toward what God says. And so look what He says. Today, if you hear His voice. In other words, everybody ain't hearing it. I have uh, I get tickled at y'all sometimes. Now I ain't gonna call out no names, but I get tickled at my at, at my congregation sometimes because you'll you'll talk about you'll talk to me or you'll say something to somebody about boy brother Kevin was preaching on this this morning, <clears throat> and I'll walk away going, I never said anything <laughs> about that. And I'll actually think to myself, how in the world did you even hear that? But again, it's just funny, but here's the point. You don't always hear God's voice. Sometimes we hear what we want to hear, don't we? And let me tell you, again, I'm not going to embarrass you, so I'm not going to start giving examples, but that's usually the case. Whenever somebody is saying, boy, Brother Kevin was preaching on this this morning, and I walk away and I'm going... That ain't even close to what I was preaching. The truth of the matter is, usually it's because they heard what they wanted to hear. Not what God was actually saying. And so here's what He says very plainly. Today, if you hear His voice, if you hear Him talking to you, you got two choices. The first one here is you can harden your heart the same way they did in the rebellion. You can do that. Many of them did it. I would say probably about a million of them. They, say, they, they, they estimate, I don't know where they get this number, but they say it's about a million that come out of Egypt and crossed over the Red Sea. Do you know how many of those entered into the Promised Land? Joshua and Caleb. Over a million people, if their estimate is right, fell in that wilderness because they hardened their heart toward the Word of God. God said to them, I'm bringing you out of slavery and I'm taking to you to a land filled with milk and honey. And along the way they said, man, it, we had it so much better back in slavery. All the way they grumbled and complained. And you know what that said? That said, we don't really believe what you're telling us, God. We don't really believe you're with us. We don't really believe this land is flowing milk and honey. We actually believe it was better back in Egypt. And instead of listening to God and following God and trusting God and pursuing the land that He has for them, they kept looking back saying, this is better, this is better, this is better. And guess what we do? Are we really any different a lot of times? And so today... If you hear His voice, don't harden your hearts like they did in the rebellion. rebellion. But here's the problem. The problem is that most of us, we harden our hearts. And that's a symptom of we don't want to hear the Word of God. Let me prove it to you. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Again, I'm pointing out to you that this is what this author was seeing. This is what he saw in this church. Look what he says. 
about this we have much to say and it is hard to explain. He's been talking to them about the deep things of Jesus. About how Jesus represented all the Old Testament priesthood and the high priests and the sacrifices. And He stops and He says, you know, i got so much to say about Jesus and it's hard to explain. Especially since you have become what? That word dull can also be translated sluggish, lazy. You don't come in here with the heart that says, God, I want to be pleasing to You. God, I want to walk out of here different. God, I want to repent of my sin. God, I want to put off what don't belong and put on what does. God, I want to follow You because I believe You. I'm going to that land. I'm going to enter Your rest. And instead of coming in here with that kind of mindset, you know what happens to us? We become dull of hearing. You know why I said us? Because you know, sometimes the only reason I study and the only reason I read the Word is because y'all got to eat. You know what a famous preacher say? Here, here is one of the most famous sayings of all preachers. Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. Sunday's always coming. Wednesday's always coming. There's always some event coming that we got to speak at or we got to do something for. There's always some kind of Bible study that we got to get ready for. Sunday's always coming. And sometimes I get dull of hearing. And that is a symptom of falling away from a living God. And I need to recognize that symptom and put my antennas up and say, God, I want to hear from you. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to follow you. I want to hear your voice today. And I don't want to harden my heart. I want to soften my heart and I want to follow you. And so again, the third symptom is very simple. You hear His voice, but you harden your heart to Him. I wish I had time to go to Hebrews chapter 6, but maybe you can go there later and you can look at how he was talking to a church there. And he told them, he said, y'all have all sit under the Word of God and it's like a field. He said, it's like a field that the rain fell on. You've all heard the Word of God. It's been taught to you. It's been showered on you. You heard His voice. Everybody heard it together. Believers and unbelievers. And he said, and on some of the ground, it produced a good fruit. And it's near to be, and it's going to be blessed by God. But on some of that same ground that got the same rain, it produced thorns and thistles. And it's near to being cursed in the end. And so ultimately, what he's saying there is very simple. We hear the word over and over and over. And yet, instead of it causing us to bear good fruit and grow good things for God, it produces thorns and thistles because we we harden our heart toward it. And ultimately, there's two differences. The ones that produce the good fruit will prove that they held on to their confidence firm to the end. They didn't have an evil, unbelieving heart. They had a believing heart. And the ones that heard the same word, the same rain fell on it and produced thorns and thistles, they will prove that they had an evil, unbelieving heart falling away from a living God. So if you are dull of hearing this morning, if the Word of God is not valuable to you, if you're not really concerned about learning and hearing from Him, then I'm telling you that's a symptom that you are beginning to fall away from the living God. And you can either harden your heart toward it, and some of you will. Some of you will walk out of here today and you will harden your heart toward it. And nothing will change. Or you can hear His voice and you can listen to Him and you can say, God, You're right. I'm wrong. I repent. I confess my sin. I turn around and I want to hear from You, learn from You, and I want to follow You. Finally, what's the solution to not falling away? I'll go through these very quickly. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. What's the solution? Here's what he says. Now, again, at the end of it in verse 19, he says, So we see they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So again, there's the root of the problem. If you really believe God, 
you're going to be staying away from the wrath and you're going to be pursuing what He has promised. There is a land flowing with milk and honey and I believe Him. And I'm going toward that and I'm leaving this. But unbelief, you will look back and say, I don't believe what He says. I'll just stay right here where I'm at. So what do we do? How do we respond to seeing these symptoms? Verse 1 of chapter 4, Therefore, while the promise of entering His rest still stands, guess what? There's still opportunity today, guys. There ain't no reason for any of you to leave here this morning feeling like, well, I'm hopeless. (laughs) There ain't no hope for me. If you leave here this morning, you didn't hear His voice. You heard what you wanted to hear. And you just wanted to give up. You just wanted to quit. That's what you wanted. Because it's too hard. Your drooping hands have drooped too far. Your knees are too weak. And it's just too hard. But there is a promise still today to enter His rest. And since it still stands, here's your response. Let us what? Fear. Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. You know, one of the best things that you can have in your life that's going to keep you on the straight and narrow? Fear. Fear of what? Fear of the fact that He said there's going to be a lot that ain't going to enter His rest. He said, I swore that they will not enter my rest. That ought to make some of us scared because if you don't enter the rest, you know where you go? Let us fear. Fear. That is not a bad thing when it's healthy because a healthy fear doesn't turn us away from it and we run from Him trembling. A healthy fear runs us to His mercy that He still offers. God, thank You that You're still offering mercy. Thank You that the promise still stands. Thank You that as long as it's called today, I still have an opportunity. I still have time. God, thank You. Thank You that I can turn away from my sin and I can know that that's the evidence that I'm staying in You. And so, while the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us fear. So that's the first thing. Have a healthy fear of these symptoms since anything else proves that you have an evil, unbelieving heart. The next thing comes from verse 2. For good news, here's why you should fear. For good news came to us just as it did to them. What good news? I'm going to deliver you out of slavery. I'm going to bring you into a promised land. I'm going to save you. The same news that they got is the same news that you got, right? But the message they heard, and he's talking about the ones that fell in the wilderness, the ones that rebelled because they didn't believe, the message they heard did not benefit them. Why? Because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Here's the next thing that you do. When you hear the Word of God, mix it with faith. They heard the same Word. The good news, God was... Do you think that God ever quit speaking to them those 40 years in that wilderness? Not a single time. He kept talking. He kept talking. The rain kept pouring down. But some of them mixed it with faith, Joshua and Caleb to be exact, and some of them did not mix it with faith. They heard it but they didn't truly believe it. And if you will take the Word of God that you heard today and mix it with faith and believe it, you'll turn and you'll start walking the right way. You will get back in the race. And you will be a part of this exhorting one another. And you will want to see each other stay in the race and help each other get up when they're down. But you have to mix the message of God with faith. It's not just enough to hear His Word and remain the same because that's what they did. And guess what happened? They fell in the wilderness. They did not enter His rest. Finally, last point. Verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 4. Here's the last solution to not falling away. For we who have believed enter that rest. For we who have believed Enter that rest. What is the key? What was the source of falling away from the living God? And what is the source of staying true and entering the rest? Not real difficult, is it? The question I have for you this morning is, do you believe God? Do you believe Him? 
Because they said they believed Him. But they fell in the wilderness. Because the evidence was they didn't really believe. The question is, do you really believe? And if you believe what God says, the wrath is coming. But I will save you and bring you into a new land. And I will give you the truth and the truth shall set you free. And if you abide in my truth and in my word, you are truly my disciples indeed. And if you continue in your original confidence firm to the end, you have become a partaker of Jesus Christ. But if not, you are near to falling away from the living God and you are near to proving that you never truly believed to begin with. If y'all would stand this morning as we give an invitation for whatever it is that God has spoke to you. If you see any of these symptoms in your life, there's no better time than for you to humble yourself. You're not coming up here to tell me what a good job I did. All I did was told you what God has already said. I mean, I, I didn't add anything to it at all, did I? Nothing. You have the Word of God. Today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart as they did in the rebellion. Listen. Mix it with faith. Believe God. And go back into the race. Lifting up your droopy hands, strengthening your weak knees, and getting back to following Him with your original confidence.